Hi everyone, welcome to week 6 of Unreal Landscapes. Um, I've been getting a lot of requests to show how I kind of set up the third person characters that we used in the week 4 tutorial. And so I wanted to go through that today to set up some humanoids. Um, and then we'll kind of develop those characters from there a little bit further than what I had last week. So to start off you'll need some kind of character to animate. Um, now I'm going to use this Cyclops character from the Dark Forest, um, which means you can't use it in any of your games, but you can use it just to test and set things up. Um, this character was actually made using like plasticine and then it was 3D scans, so that's why it has that like grubby plasticine look. Um, and then I've converted it to like a really low poly efficient mesh and it has a normal map with it as well. Um, and so to rig this character up, we're going to use Mixamo. So it's just going to be a bit easier for a humanoid. We'll pop over to Mixamo and log in. Um, just remember your student account, for some reason, they don't have access to Mixamo, so you need to use a personal account, same as me. Great, so once we're in Mixamo, you can see it actually saved the character from last time I used this. I'm going to go upload character and then just drop in the actual mesh that you're going to use. So I just need to download this guy. And I'm also going to download that normal map. Um, and if they're in the same folder, there's a high chance that Mixamo will actually pull in that normal map, but let's see. So we'll go and drop our Cyclops in. And it's a pretty quick upload because it's a really low poly character. And then we'll go to our auto rigging um, character. So we've got this kind of T-pose shape. I'm not going to have full on fingers and everything like that. And um, it's going to be a little bit weird and not properly blended on some of the animations because we don't have like a separated head from the chest. Um, so. I have to be a little bit careful with the types of animations that I use because I'm going to get weird tearing. Um, now what you can do is you could rig this up in Maya and then um, Mixamo would actually use your rig and then kind of remap or retarget the animation to your rig. Um, so that's probably the correct way of doing it, but I'm just going to do this quick and dirty way. Um, the game I'm working on is meant to look a little bit kind of punk anyway, a little bit dodgy, um, so I'm not going to worry about that. Um, and here I'm just turning off this use symmetry mode so I can kind of target things a little bit better and I'm just going to move these wrists down a bit and the elbows up. So we've got something like that. Knees are down here, left and right. The groin is here. Um, okay. Let's see how we go with that. And um, there's a few different options. I'm going to actually pick the no fingers mesh because I don't have any. Great. Or maybe we can do two chain fingers. Let's try that. So Mixamo is doing its thing and rigging up our character, so we'll just wait while that finishes up. Okay, we're back. Um, and so our rig is looking pretty good. It's got this weird like head deformation thing happening, but um, we can just deal with that. So what we'll do is just hit next here, and it's going to upload that character, and it's going to wipe out whatever character we're working on, so just keep that in mind as well. And we can hit this skeleton view here and see like that's mapped pretty well. Um, so what we can do now is just download the character in its kind of base T-pose state. And we'll just need that as kind of the base skeleton. Um, so what we'll do is I'll just make a new folder here. Um, so we'll go Unreal Tute level. Let's go Cyclops tutorial. 
And then in here, we'll name this one Cyclops Base Skeleton. Well, maybe say T pose. Um, because it'll be named Skeleton by Unreal. So we'll drop in that kind of basic rig into that folder there and save that out. Um, and now we can go through and find some different animations that we like. So I think I used like a goofy, I think it was called Goofy Run, um, which everyone seemed to like. So we'll grab that Goofy Run again. Um, one thing to just note, you need to tick in place here for all of these animations. Um, otherwise, you're going to have to kind of solve the root motion of the animation, which just gets a little bit messy. So let's only choose ones that are just moving in place as kind of a state, and then we'll be able to animate between those different states later on. So that's looking good. We can, um, you know, we can crank up some of these values if we wanted to, feet kick. Yeah, that one looks good. Stride length. This should almost be smaller maybe. Okay, so once we've had a play and we've got in place ticked here, we'll just download again. Um, and here we just want to choose a 60 FPS animation, making sure that we've got FBX binary selected with skin and no reduction. And we'll download that. And so this one will name Cyclops Run Anim. We'll download that. And we also need a, what else have we got that's goofy? Just dancing. Okay, maybe we can do the, um, I forget what this dance is actually called. It's like the shimmy or the wiggle or something. Um, we'll download this one for fun. Um, now what I will need is just a regular walk animation. Um, so I think this one will work because it's got the same sort of arm movement as the other animation, the running one. So we'll make sure to tick in place there and bring in that leisurely walk. We'll download that. Okay. And I'm also going to download this sort of stompy jump. Um, so we'll get that happening as well. Okay. So now we've got all of these different animations plus our regular T-Pose skeleton. Um, we might not end up using all of these, but we'll just see how we go. Um, so now we need to start importing all of these and there's actually a very kind of specific way we need to import things. So the first thing we need to import is our T-Pose just by itself. Don't import anything else. So I'll come over um, to my content folder, blueprints, and we'll just make a new folder that's called Cyclops character. And I'll bring in my Cyclops T-Pose. And we'll just need to bring up the FBX import options here and ensure that we've got skeletal mesh ticked on and import mesh ticked on here. Um, the rest, I think we can just leave as default, um, as well as we can turn off animations here because this is just the T pose. So once we've fixed up those settings, we can hit import all. And you'll see, unlike when we bring in a regular, just 3d mesh, because we've got that skeleton attached, we're now getting a skeleton mesh or skeletal mesh rather. We're getting our physics asset, which just controls like the actual um, physics makeup of our character and its colliders. So that's looking good. And we've also got our skeleton, which is basically our rig. Um, and you can see all of those components here. Um, and like you could use these and edit these skeletons in actual um, 
in Unreal if you needed to and do stuff like skeleton retargeting. So if you had animations that were built for one skeleton, you could actually retarget those animations to this one um, through this retarget manager here. But today we're going to use the animations from Mixamo that are like working with this direct character here. So once we've done that, we might want to also create our material. So we'll say M underscore Cyclops. And we'll just also bring in that normal map from Canvas. So we'll open up our material, drop in our normal map. Hook that up here and we can remember preview our material on the object by hitting this button here. So that looks good. Um, and then we might want a little bit of a different color. So let's just drop in a base color. Maybe today he can be like a fleshy sort of color. This is kind of the color of the actual Play-Doh that we use to create these characters. And um, I might be able to control the roughness as well. Let's just get a sort of basic setup here, something like that. Okay, so that is the character with the normal map. This is without. So you can see it's quite a difference in the detail there. Cool. Um, and so once we've got that set up, we'll go over to our skeleton here and then we'll just apply that material in the material slot here. Great. So that's set up by default. So now what we might want to do is add in this skeleton to a uh, actual controller. Um, so I'm going to just use the first person controller here. So this is the same one as um, we made in the first week. And you can download that from Canvas as well if you need to. Um, so what I'm going to do is duplicate that and we'll name this BP Cyclops character and I'll drop that in here right um, and then we'll edit this one so we're going to go over to our character mesh here and we will set our skeletal mesh asset to be our Cyclops and now you can see it's popped in you can delete this static mesh now as well um, and we just need to get them positioned within the capsule. So we'll do that, make sure they're pointing the correct way. Uh, and we can tell because the camera that we have here is aligned in this direction and our arrow component, um, which I can't actually see right now. Oh, there it is sticking out there. It's pointing that way. And as we did last week as well, we need to add a spring arm and drop our camera inside. Cool. And um, we can also adjust the sort of length of the spring arm here. So something like that, we can bring it a little bit closer. Um, and if we want to, we can preview this in our scene too. So we'll dock this here and drop our new character into the scene. So that's what that camera is looking like. Um, and one thing that's really nice to do with the spring arm is to add a little bit of camera lag so that it actually, when you whip around the mouse, it takes a sec for the camera to kind of catch up and we can enable that on as like the position and also the rotation of the camera. So let's just compile that now and just see if that's working as it is. And of course I forgot to set this up to be possessed. So we'll just search for possess, player zero. And we will also 
um, make sure it's using our not your our pitch great okay let's test that out so now we're playing as this character we can move around in our t-pose state um, but obviously we don't have any animations happening yet okay so we've got a third person character now and a controller that's working with it um, but what we don't have is any of the animations so what we need to do now is bring in all those animation assets um, and what I might suggest is set up another folder because it gets messy quickly called animations and we'll go back to where we downloaded all those FBX files so we'll go back to our Cyclops tutorial and we'll grab all of the other files so we'll deselect the typos and now we'll drag in all of the different Cyclops animations and the important thing to do here is we actually don't want to get their skeleton again um, because we're already having a, a skeleton in our scene with that T-posed asset. So what we need to do is select the T-posed skeleton. So everything gets kind of applied to that skeleton. Um, and we want to not import the meshes. So we've got our skeleton applied here and we've ticked off import mesh. We don't want to do that. Um, but of course we do want to import the animations, which you can see is already set up here. So once we've done that, we're going to hit import all. And we've now got all these different animations with our character targeted. And I'm just going to do a quick save. So if we go into one of these animations, we can see that character animated here. Um, and you'll get this like editor window where we can actually switch between the different animations here. So there's our dance, our running, and our walking. Great. So that's looking good. Um, there are a lot of settings on the side here as well um, that you can play with. So if this animation, for example, was a bit too slow for you, this walk, you could increase the rate scale here, get that playing back a bit quicker. Um, you can choose if they loop or not, but ours are already looping animations, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, and then if you did have one that's got a moving root, which is like if we have the spine, which is like the root of our skeletal mesh. So if we look at our skeleton, these are all based on the hips for a Mixamo. So the hips is the root. If the, if the root is moving forward, so like one of those Mixamo animations that the character actually jumps or like moves directionally front to back or up and down, then we might need to enable root motion here as well. So you can see for this animation, I don't, I don't want to do that because it's um, stuffing it up, but Sometimes you might need to enable that if you've got kind of uh, articulating root. Okay, so the first thing we probably want to do is set up our just basic movement. So what we're going to do is create what's called an animation blend space. So we'll go over to animation here and we'll say blend space and we'll make sure to choose our T-Pose skeleton. And let's call this Cyclops Locomotion Blend. And so we'll open that one up um, and you'll see that actually replaced our animation window. And that's because we have like these buttons here, which will switch between our skeletal mesh, our actual root skeleton here, our animations, but also like our blend spaces in this tab, um, and then our physics asset at the end here. So now we've got this like grid down the bottom, and it's a little bit hard to understand what's happening until you start setting it up. But essentially, we can have multi 
multiple axes of animation blending here. So for example, if we had all of the animations, we could have a forward movement animation, a backward movement animation here, a left and a right as well. Um, but for now, we're just going to use kind of like a basic speed. So we'll have like not moving, what animation are we doing? A walking animation and then a running animation. And I actually just realized I forgot to get an idle animation. So I'm going to go back to Mixamo and download an extra one now. Um, so we'll download, I think I was using these dwarf idols because they're quite funny. Um, so I'm going to download the crazy gesture as well. Cyclops, and then this one will be called idle. Okay, great. So we'll quickly import that one as well and just make sure we're choosing the same settings. So we're going to pick that mesh. We're not going to import a mesh. It's good. And now that idle animation is showing up here. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this X axis along the bottom here to control our speed. So what we need to do is make sure that we're back onto our locomotion blend space here. And on the left side, you've got a horizontal and a vertical axis. So you can have like two axes of blending. Um, we're just going to use the horizontal here. So we'll name this one character speed. And we know that from like our default settings on a character. So if we go and look at the actual character class, um, we've got a sprint speed of a thousand here that we, this one we picked and a default speed of 600. So we kind of need to go from zero up to a thousand um, for our graph here. So we'll go from zero up to 1000. Um, and then we need to have, maybe let's have 10 divisions along that axis so that we know that one, two, three, four, five, six here will be our walk speed. And then here will be our sprint. And then back here will be just nothing. So what we can start doing then is dropping in our different animations along that axis. So we'll drag in our idle and that's going to be at this zero zero position. Now you can see our character's doing its thing. We'll drag in our walk at one, two, three, four, five, six. So this will be 600 speed here, right? And then we'll drag in our run right at the end. And this green X, we can move the position by holding down control and we can move around here. So this is like our idle. And then as we start picking up speed, we're going to start moving a little bit here, but we're still kind of doing both animations. And now we're walking and now we're blending between walking and running. And so we get to that full sprint at the end. So with that set up now, um, we need to actually create what's called an animation blueprint um, to kind of trigger and control this blend, blend space. Um, so for example, if we actually just go to our Cyclops character here, um, there's a slot on the side here called animation and we've got animation mode, use animation blueprint. Um, we could also, if this was like an idle NPC, that's just kind of background. We could just say, use animation asset and then pick our idle animation. And so then in our scene, our character would always be doing that animation. Um, but then you can see it's not really tied to our movement at all. Right. 
So what we need to do is create a blueprint that's going to control that blend space and assign it based on the speed our character is moving at. So what we'll do is I'm just going to remove that animation asset now and go back to animation blueprint. And we will create a new animation blueprint. So I'm going to go into my animation. Uh, actually, we'll keep it in the root folder here. So we'll right click in the empty space, go over animation again, and now we're going to create an animation blueprint. And again, we're going to pick our Tipo skeleton and we'll name this Cyclops um, Anim BP. Maybe let's call it animation blueprint. Let's go Cyclops. Okay, great. So we'll open this guy up. Um, and you can see now that we've done that and assigned it to the same mesh, we've now got this like extra button here, which is our blueprint tab. Um, and you can see we're outputting a pose and, and this kind of needs to take a node. So this is a very familiar setup now. So what we need to do is create a state machine and that'll let us blend between different states to control what animations are kind of playing on our character. Um, and we're really just going to have one state, which is the locomotion, and then we'll have a few different actions, like the jumping and the dancing, that might interrupt that. So what we're going to do is create a new state machine. So we'll search for state machine, and we'll get this animation tab with the kind of window icon here. And now we've got a new state machine. We can hook that up to our output pose. And then if we hit compile, you can see the state machine is like sending a result to our graph, but there's a warning that this is just an empty state. So we'll double click our state machine and you can see that that's kind of moved us another level deeper in our graph here. And you can go back and forth at the top hierarchy. And the first thing we need to do is make a new state that we enter into um, for our state machine. So we'll drag out here and we'll say add state and we'll call this one locomotion. So this is just our regular kind of movement. Um, and then now we can actually double click this one and we'll enter that state. So we're a couple of layers deep now. Um, and now this state is asking for an output animation pose. So what we're going to do is get our animation blend space. So our locomotion blend and drop that in. And we'll now connect the animation pose here. And if we hit compile, we should now see that we're like doing our idle pose and we're looking for this character speed. And so you can see if I crank this up to 600 and compile again, now we're doing our walk animation. So we've got our blending happening and we just need to somehow control this variable. So what we can do now, is go over to our event graph. And so this is kind of separate to these state machine tabs that we've got happening here. We've got our event graph where we can get data live. Um, and there's this event blueprint update animation, which is essentially like the event tick, but for animations. And so what we want to do is we want to get the speed of our character, right? And we want to plug it into this character speed um, input here so that we can output the correct animation based on the speed that we're moving. So in our event graph then, what we can do is every frame we can cast to, and we should be pretty used to casting by now, we can cast to our Cyclops character so that's the BP Cyclops character, All right? And then we need to know which character are we talking about. Um, and so what we want to do is say, try get pawn owner. Um, and you want to make sure that you're using this one rather than like get player index or get player character. 
Um, because if you do that, then all of your animations will be linked to the character, uh, the instance of the character. So like if the character's moving, then all the different NPCs that use the same blueprint will also be doing their movement animation. So it's key that you just keep this try get pawn owner um, node in here and you use that when you're casting to your character. So now that we're casting to our character, we need to get the character's velocity. So we need to drag off this as blueprint Cyclops character node here, and then we'll say get velocity. And we'll scroll down to the bottom and say, find this get velocity. And we can see that this is going to return our velocity in centimeters per second of the root component. And the target is an actor. So we're going to get that velocity. Um, you can see that what we're returning here is a vector because it's yellow. So we need to get the length of that vector by searching for vector length, right? And then we need to make a new variable in here, which is going to be our speed. So character speed, and this will be a float. We'll save that drop it in and we're going to set the character speed and we're going to equal the speed of our Cyclops character here and then we'll just hook up that event. And so now every frame we're getting our blueprint Cyclops character and we're finding the velocity that that character is moving at based on our character controller and then we're setting this like internal variable called character speed which is a float. Now we can go ahead and grab our character speed, right? And then we'll connect that up to the character speed that we're looking for from our blend space. So everything now is put together. We've got our character speed out of our controller. We're plugging it into our blend space. We should be good to go now and start testing that out. Um, now I just hit play and I haven't assigned my blueprint animation yet to my character. So that's why you're not seeing anything. So the last thing we need to do is come up here, um, to the root level and our animation section here, and just make sure we're saying use an animation blueprint and that we're picking our animation blueprint Cyclops here. And now we should be good to go. So you can see we're doing our idle. And if I hit play, we're doing our idle as we're not moving. And then we start walking and we're strutting our stuff. And now if we hold shift and start running, then we're doing our run. Um, and that's all blending together really nicely. We're back, I just had a little break, and we've got this character moving around and we can kind of walk and run and that blending's done. So we've done a lot of the hard work already. Um, what we might wanna do now is set up our different action animations. So we had our jump and our dance so that we can kind of trigger those on top of these animations. Cause you can see as I jump, we're just still doing our regular walk or run animation. So to do that, we're going to have to get our animations and turn them into what's called animation montages. And animation montages are like kind of one-off fireable animations. Um, and you can actually stack together multiple animations inside one montage and have multiple things happen at once as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to come over to one of our animations here. So we've got our Cyclops jump and we'll right click it. And at the very top, there's these animation sequence actions. We're going to select create and choose to create an animation montage. And we'll say Cyclops, Cyclops, jump, montage. And so if we open up our montage, we can see we've got our Cyclops jumping here um, and what we could also do if we wanted to is like scroll out a little bit to add on some more time. And we could also add in a second animation. We just need to drag it onto this top slot area. And now you can see we're like montaging two different 
animation clips together. Um, but for this case, we're just going to do the one. Um, so we'll stick with that 63, a 63 animation, and it's just got our jump happening inside there. Um, and sorry, I just broke that. Great. So we'll save that one. Um, but you can see like this Cyclops montage occurs in what's called the default slot. And these are like, we can have different slots of animations playing on our one skeletal component at a time. Um, so right now, if you think about our locomotion, if we go back to our kind of parent event, uh, where are we? So lost. If we go back to our default animation graph, we're kind of filling up the slot at the moment with this state machine. So what we need to do is create an empty slot. Um, so we'll say empty no, default slot. And so now we're, we've kind of exposed our slot um, to this like output pose. And what that lets us do now is like override this slot here at this point and output something else into our output graph. Um, so we're going to override this state machine that's coming in with our action animation. So if we come back to our Cyclops character, we've actually already got this event of jump. Um, so what we can do is we can just change this so that we're going to play a montage at this point. So what we can do is drag off the pin there and we'll say play montage here. Um, and the montage to play is going to be our Cyclops animation. So if we compile that and save that out, let's just test and see if that's working as is. So we can run and then we can jump. Um, but you can see it's not actually triggering at the current time. So we'll come back to our character and maybe we need to then add in a skeletal mesh component. Um, so what we can do is we can drag in our character mesh and hook up our skeletal mesh component there. Let's see if that works. And I might have also not saved here too. So let's try that. And there you go. You can see we're doing our jump now when we press space. Um, now, it, <laughs> it looks a bit weird. So maybe we should have chosen a different animation. Um, or maybe we need to actually trim up the animation so it occurs straight away. So maybe what we do is we'll come over to our, um, our animation montage here as well. And maybe we'll trim off this whole like squatting part here. So it just comes from like this more compressed state. Oh, actually, sorry, we'll have to do that on the base animation, I think. So what we'll do is we'll select the part of the frame that we want. So I think we're looking at frame 31 here and we'll right click and we'll say remove frame zero to frame 31. So it's just gonna cut out all of that space. So now the animation just kind of plays from this position. Um, and maybe we wanna cut off some of the end landing here because this is like a stationary jump that we've gotten and we actually really need one that's more in motion. So the, and the other fix would then be just to like get a different sort of animation, but maybe we'll cut off some of this end here. So we'll remove frame 54 to 97, save that. And let's try that now. So that's looking a bit better. Uh, we've kind of got this like nice like skid, <laughs> which is really interesting. Um, I think it's because our actual Montage has not updated to match the new time of our animation. So if we go in here, yeah, it's still frame 63. Um, whereas our animation is now, I just keep getting lost. Our animation is now just 52 frames. So we, we just need to update this one to be 52 frames long instead. 
Okay, there we go. So just by dragging that slider here and hitting reset, it's now picked up the new time of the animation. So we can test that out again. Um, and so we can hit space and we're doing our jump and then we're back to back to action. And there is kind of like a bit of an automatic blend happening there. Um, but that's looking good. <laughs> It's like he's doing an ollie or something. <laughs> I don't know if I've played it. some skate games, but um, looks like he's doing an ollie, so that's cool. All right, so we've got jumping. Um, we've also got our dance, so we'll need to convert our dance into an animation montage as well. So we'll go create animation montage. We'll say, yeah, Cyclops dance montage, whatever, um, and then. In our jump here, we're going to need to, oh sorry, in our event graph for our character, we're going to need to create a new event to trigger the dance. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, maybe we'll just make it like when we press one on our keyboard. Um, and by the way, I just, so I just right clicked and pressed one, and now I can get an event when we press one from the keyboard access. And so we can say when we've, Pressed one, we're going to play a montage and we'll get our skeletal component again, drag that in, and we'll pick our montage to play, which will be our dance, compile that out. And now if we play as well, we're going to start grooving. <laughs> so that's pretty good. Um, but you can see that that then kind of overrides everything. So maybe there's like, maybe we want to keep walking when we're moving um, while we dance with like the top half if we're doing that. So that's an option as well. We can kind of blend parts of our character together. So to do something like that, where we've got the top half doing one animation and the bottom doing another, we need to go back to our animation blueprint and set up some blending. So at the moment, we've got our state machine, which is for our locomotion. And then we're kind of overriding it with the default slot where our montages are playing. And then that's being output to the graph. What we need to do now is kind of like when we were working with materials and we had like different set and get material attributes node and nodes and we're kind of blending between those different nodes. It's the same sort of concept. So we're going to take our animation and export it into what's called a pose. And then we're going to be able to blend those different animation poses together. So I'm going to disconnect this one and we're going to go out from our locomotion state machine here and we'll search for create pose. Um, sorry, we'll search for new saved pose, new save cache pose. And we can name our save cache pose something like movement pose. And now what we can do is we can get that movement pose. We'll say movement pose. And you can see this cached pose that we've now saved appears, use cache pose. And we can drop that back into our slot. So if we compile that, nothing's actually changed at this point. Like we're still jumping around and we're, we're doing our dancing, right? We're kind of exporting the pose into this cache and then we're retrieving it into, uh, we're retrieving it and, and still overriding it with the slot. But what we can do now is actually blend between this one that has the override and our base movement pose um, and we can blend those in a few different ways. So one way we might want to blend it is using um, the actual skeleton itself. So if I grab another cached pose and then we say blend skeleton, um, sorry, blend per bone, actually it's called. So we're going to use a layered blend per bone. And here we're looking for two of these poses. So one, this bottom one, we're going to output our 
default slot, our montage, and then the top one, we're going to just input the kind of base movement. From here, we need to also choose how we're going to split up and blend that animation. Um, so if we go to this like blend mode layer setup index and then add a new element, open that. So there's quite a few branching elements. You can see here, we're looking for like a bone name. Um, and so if we go returning back to our skeleton with this button here, we can have a look and see that like, we've got a few different parts here. Um, but on the actual Mixamo meshes, this spine is right at the center and it splits the legs and the top half elements here. So we're going to be splitting at spine so that the top half is playing one animation, our dance, and then the bottom half is doing our regular movement. So to do that, we'll go back to our graph here. Um, and what we're going to do is just enter that name of that bone, which is spine, and we'll save that out. Um, and then one last thing, because I could just see here that my character then stopped moving, I just need to hook up this animation pose that we've now blended into our output pose. Great. So now we can walk around, and if we dance, we're just doing this little kind of jiggy dance with the top half of our body. Um, and it's not affecting the bottom half. And we can do that while we're sprinting as well. <laughs> um, now, one thing to note here is because we've just created that as a montage and like blending between the full slot, if we actually jump now, we're not doing the jump with the bottom half of our body. So maybe we want some elements to blend and then some elements to just fully override. Um, and so we could do that by kind of blending again here. Um, so if I break this and then we blend one more time, so we'll go blend pose um, and we're going to use just like a bool. So if I search blend poses by bool, you can now output that one. And we can say, basically what we're going to want is when we're jumping, we're going to be setting a bool to be true. And we want it to like override the pose with our full jump montage. And if we're not jumping, then we want this like halfway sort of dance. So here we've already got that like halfway dance with the top half moving and then the bottom half doing the kind of regular walking animation. So this is actually going to be our false state. And then what we're going to do is grab this whole element here. So the cache pose plus the slot again. And remember as this worked before, this will be like a full body thing. That'll be our true state. And then we just need to know when we're jumping or not. So we're back at our character blueprint now, and you can see this is where we have our jump action. And then we're setting our character to jump then we're playing the jump animation. So what we're going to want to do is just in between these steps, we're going to set a bool, um, which I already made, but I'll just show you how to do that again. So we're going to set a bool that's called jumping, and maybe we'll say is jumping. All right, and we'll drop that in. So we're going to set is jumping, and make sure you hit the little eye here so it's going to be visible to our other blueprints. So when we jump, we're going to set is jumping to be true. And then we're going to play our montage. And then once we've completed our montage, we're then going to set is jumping to be false, right? And that's our full kind of loop. Now we need to get this value and we're going to have to do the same thing we did with the speed. So we'll go back to our event graph here and we'll come back. So we're, we're back on our blueprint, um, animation blueprint, back to our event graph here. And we're going to, as our Cyclops character, get our jumping, which we called is jumping, right? We're going to get is jumping. And then we're going to create a new variable here called is jumping as well.
and we're going to set is jumping to be whatever our character is doing. And so we're going to do that every frame. So now at, after we set our character speed, we're also getting this like local variable called is jumping and we're basing it on the characters. Um, and now the last thing we need to do is get that variable again here and then just set it on our blend poses by bool. So that was a lot of setup work, but what we've got now is our kind of base locomotion over here. So we're creating a pose based on character movement. Here we're overriding and overriding probably has an extra R or something, whatever. Here we're overriding our movement with a montage. Right, that's what that part's doing. Here we're blending our base movements with montage by um, by bone. Right, so we're picking the like hit point and we're blending the top and the bottom half of our animation based on the bone. I don't know why I wrote boast. Right. And then here we're fully overriding the blend if we're jumping. And so you could set up a few different animations to go through this slot. Um, and so maybe it's not like a jumping specific thing. It's just like a f if this is a full body animation bool, and then maybe you're doing extra animations through there. Cool. So if we save that out now and we play so we can do our dance while we walk, which is cool. And if we jump, we're still doing our full body jump um, with the feet going up like that with our sick ollie. So that was a lot, but now we've got a third person character and we've been able to set up these kind of different actions and events and trigger montages that override our base blended animation system. Uh, and so with these tools, I hope that you can set up your own animations and make some really interesting stuff. Um, it is a big investment to go for a third person character versus a first person because you really see the entire way they interact with the world. Um, and, you know, if you're dealing with like item pickups and the physics of the character, there's a lot more to do there. So just keep that in mind, but if you do want to go for a third person character, um, it's going to take up quite a bit of your development time. So then maybe you have to balance that out in other places. So the final part of today's tutorial is working with some skeletons and animations that are a bit simpler, so not a full character. Um, so we can start to create some interactions in our world. Um, so what I've got is this kind of blob and, um, let's see if we can view that blob. Um, cool. So I've got this blob, um, and this is another sort of plasticine asset. And I just went in Maya and added a couple of joints throughout. So there's one at the base and then a couple going up to the end. Um, you can almost imagine it like a finger and I just did an automatic weight paint. So. It's not very good, but um, you know, it's quick, <laughs> which is key. So what I've got is that object. And if we bring that in, you can see that we're also going to have like its own skeletal mesh and everything. Um, we don't have any animations here, so we'll import that. And I'll make this object also available for you on Canvas so you can have a play around. Um, let's put this in a new folder. We'll call it small pointer and we'll grab our different pieces here just so we can see what's happening, be clearer. 
so you can see we've got our skeletal mesh object, which is quite small if we drop it into the world. So we might have to fix that later. It's basically a finger size, right? So we've got that. Um, if we have a look at our skeleton, you can see here it's super basic. It's just a couple of joints here moving through. Um, and, you know, this is kind of the deformation that we've got currently. Um, and so what we want to do is turn this rig that we've got here into something that we can actually control a little bit more. Um, so what we're going to do is create what's called a control rig um, for that character. And we'll do some like basic IK solving on that to get something happening. So we'll select our skeletal mesh and right click, and then we'll say create a um, control rig down the bottom. And you can see that that's created the control rig for our skeletal mesh, and we'll go ahead and open that up. Um, and so what a control rig is, is like a scriptable node-based animation and rigging pipeline um, so that we can set up like full body IK for our characters. And this is how, if you've looked at Unreal's kind of demo scenes, how they've got the characters like automatically shifting their feet on top of objects and stuff. That's through here using a bunch of like different effects um, to kind of solve the full body skeleton. We're going to be solving a really, really basic skeleton today, um, but just setting up some basic control methods. So the first thing we want to do is have some sort of node at the bottom where we can control the rotation of our root bone here. So this joint one is our root bone. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to drag in that bone. And if you're not on the rig tab, you can go across here. I think by default it opens in the blueprint or something like that. So come over to the rig hierarchy here and drag in your bone. And then here we're going to set its relative transform. So we're going to set the transformation of this bone relative to the object. Um, and so if we execute that, we're not going to see anything straight away. Um, and we're just going to make sure that our child is set up as that first joint there. Okay. So now we need to give it like a value to transform by. So to do that, we're going to create what's called a control node. So if we go to new control, and then let's call this control base rotation. And so this will be like the controller that sits at the bottom of our object here um, and controls kind of where we're pointing things. So let's have a look at that. So what we can do is now drag that guy in and then we'll get the control. And then we're going to unwind our transform of our control node here. And then we're going to set the rotation to equal the value here of our base root bone. If we compile that, we should now be able to move this actual control rotation node and set the rotation of our root here. Um, I'm just noticing that our axis is like a little bit kind of wrong. Um, I'm not sure why that's happening. Okay, sorry, I think I was just setting, um, when I drag in the bone the first time, I actually need to set the rotation, not the relative transform. So we're setting the rotation of the bone based on the rotation here. Um, so we'll hook up that value and compile that. And now you can see that that's kind of working um, as intended, but by default now that we've compiled our object is laying on the ground. So we just need to write that. So rotate it 90 degrees. And then if we right click on our control base rotation and press set offset transform from current, 
it's going to set the default state to be rotated like that, like how it is in our editor here. So that's working now. We've got this like control node to control the rotation of our weird fingery tentacle thing. Um, and what we can do is then create a solver to kind of control the entire skeleton now that we've got here. So this, while this is just like five joints, it's still a skeleton. So what we can do is we can search for the full body IK here. Um, and we need to say, what is the root of our object here? So our root is going to be our joint one, which we know already. Um, and then we're going to create a new effector and the effector is going to be based on joint five. And basically we're going to be setting the position of joint five to be another control node. So we'll call a new control node. We'll call it um, point controller, something like that. Cool. And then we'll bring in that one. We'll say get control. And here we'll hook up the transform of our joint five to the transform of our control node here. And if we bring up our point control now, you can see that it's quite small because of the size of these orbs. Maybe we can make these a bit smaller. Let's see. Shape, and we're going to make these a bit smaller. I can just do that. Okay, there we go. So you can see that if I move this point control, I'm now like sort of bending that mesh, um, but it's kind of just sliding around. And why that's happening is that um, under our settings here on our root behavior, it's letting us kind of move the root based on the pull of our point controller. So we just need to say pin to input. And now we've got, that happening there. So we can now control this full system using this one node and do some sort of jabbing animations like that. So that's looking good. Um, you can play with the mass of things here as well. So, um, you know, we could change the mass to be something like 0.5 and then see how that's working. So that looks a bit smoother now to me, like I'm getting more finite deformation. Um, so I think we'll go with that and we'll save that out and compile it there. Um, and I just remembered I also need to set that default position of our point control pin here. So we'll bring that up here, right click, and we'll say set offset transform from current, compile. Now we're looking good. Okay, so we've set up a control rig now. If we head back to our scene, we can actually drag our control rig in and it's going to automatically bring up the sequencer for us, which is nice. And I'm just going to scale this up because it's a bit small. And what we might do is make an animation that kind of has the tentacle push down, look around, and then jab out in a straight line. Um, so you can see in our control rig, we have these two different positions here. So I can get our point controller and we can start building some sort of animation. So we might first set a default pose here. Let's just have a look. So I think this is like the jabbing kind of direction. So we'll set a default pose like that, and then we'll hit this add a new keyframe button. And then I'm also going to copy that to the end of our animation here. And then we'll have the control node kind of drop down a bit like it's hunting around maybe a little bit further in time hunting around like that maybe it kind of 
looks left and then looks right and then it quickly jabs forward like that swipes forward and then it slowly retracts maybe it does another quick jab forward and then it slowly retracts again okay let's see that in motion so we'll play it's looking around jab jab and it returns um, I think I just need to space things out a little bit here as well. So let's do that. Down, chat, look left, right. I think these definitely need to be moved around a bit. So we've got that happening now. Um, and, you know, that would work as a sequence. But what we might want to do is now have this whole thing be exported as an animation um, because then we can create an actor that like always hunts for the target and then like jabs out in that direction for example so what we can do is we can right click our control rig here and we can say create linked animation sequence and then here we'll say um, blob jab and right so we'll export that. And now what that's done is exported us an animation. So if we come in here, we can see like, now we've got a standalone animation based on that control rig. And so we can quickly then spin out a few different animations based on work directly in Unreal. Um, so what I might do now is leave this mode and actually I can just fully delete both of these from our scene we don't need it anymore and I'm going to create a new blueprint so we're going to create a blueprint of the type actor and this is going to be like our I guess it's like a tentacle at this point um, no let's let's keep it blob blob tentacle Right, um, so we can create that and we can bring in a skeletal mesh. Right, we need our skeletal mesh. Um, we will select our blob mesh here and we'll just, at this point I'm going to scale it up, 10x. Um, and then let's just have it loop that animation that we created like that. And if we compile, we can then drop that into the scene. So let's put our blob tentacle in here and hit play. So now we've got like this tentacle going hello. <laughs> All right, so that looks good. All right, um, and if we wanted to have that that tentacle kind of bump the character, we could come down here and just enable um, our collision presets from no collision to block all. And then now we're kind of like, you know, we're going to get smacked around a bit by the tentacle. So you can see that happening there. Um, and maybe we want the tentacle to kind of like point at the player and, and try and find them. Uh, so a really basic way to do that would be just to use like a, um, use a look at function. So what we can say is if we search, find look at rotation, basically we need to give it a start position and a target position. So if we say get actor location, Right, we'll put in that as this is our self, that's our start location, and then we need to get the location of the player. So we'll say cast to our Cyclops character, um, and we're going to need the player, get player character, 
And then as that Cyclops character, we're going to get the actor location like that. And so now we've got a rotation value um, based on our character. Um, and we need to now like do this every frame. Um, and then we need to set the actor rotation. And we're going to plug in our new rotation. So we'll compile that and save that out. So now you can see that the tentacle is like always pointing towards the player, but it looks like the axis is a bit wrong. Um, and I bet if we go back to our viewport here and just add an arrow, yeah, we'll see the, the point of this, this actor is actually pointing that way. Um, so we just need to, oops, need to rotate this. So it's in line with it. So maybe 10 more degrees. Yep, that looks good to me. Save that out. And now we've got like a weird plant that's always going to try and hit the actor. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> kind of works. Yeah, it's a little bit dodgy. Um, and we probably could find a way to actually have the raw control rig like point towards the character through the blueprint, but we won't do that today. Okay, so now you should be working with skinned animations. Um, we've got our dance grooving along here. That's pretty fun. Um, it looks like we somehow undid the walking thing that we were doing before, but maybe I just hit undo too much. Not sure what happened there. Um, but yeah, that will be it for today. So we've got our character walking around. We've got some montages happening. Oh, it's working now. Look at that. We're jumping. We're dancing and we're sprinting and walking and we're being attacked by plants as well. So that'll do for today. Thanks everyone. I hope you learned a lot and you kind of understand the pipeline in Unreal a little bit more around skin mesh characters and how to set up third person controllers. Um, again, this is, you know, it's a lot to take on if you're doing a third person controller, but um, I think it's something that people completely shy away from in Unity often because it's even harder. So use the tools at your disposal and, and push yourself um, to try and make something interesting that you've never made before. All right. Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you next week.